So the question was, how can you make part of the material transparent or translucent, like the, cent the central part, and have it uh, opaque along the edge? And so what I tried to do originally was to create a, a Mila material that had uh, some sort of transmissive layer in the middle and then uh, a diffuse Fresnel layer uh, on top. But it wasn't working, and I think the reason is that that transmissive layer has to be the base layer. So if I just delete these things here. So if we start with um, just a basic material, it comes like this with uh, the base component being a diffuse layer. If you want to have that transparency, um, you can change it here to a transmissive state. There's also a transmissive clear and transmissive distance. And actually, this one is the one that I hadn't seen before, but this is actually quite useful. There used to be a very convoluted setup to make something like this, but it looks like they've got it built in. But let's look at this first when we just set it to transmissive. And you can see the other things. Uh, that are built in. So diffuse is the one that it comes bundled as, but you can change it to diffuse with a scatter component, uh, anisotropic, which means um, a specular that moves in a linear fashion, like a, a CD or a DVD when it, when it refracts the light in a certain way, or on hair when it's a long, narrow um, specular or reflection. Paint Usually when there's paint, it means it's got sub-layers of paint chips. It's got transparent layer over top, uh, color layer with flecks of something inside of it. But we're just looking at transmissive. So if we change it just to transmissive, it goes um, to transparent state. I'll just change it back to white. Um, and this comes with an ind index of refraction. So this is set to 1.5, which is something like a, a crystal. You can change it to, I think water is 1.33. So it's how it's going to refract the objects that you see through it. So <clears throat> if we render this, I've got the object behind it so we can just see what it's doing. It's taking a long time to render. So it's taking a long time to render because you can see it's got glossiness uh, or roughness turned on, so it's got to refract an object through it, but also blur that object as it goes through. So I've got this sort of checkerboard sphere on the other side. I'm just going to escape out. You can see that it's acting like a transparent thing. So roughness is set to 0.4. If I turn this down to zero, it should probably render more quickly. So you can see what roughness does, because it has to blur the image as it goes through. So we're seeing that object being refracted through that sphere. So I'm going to turn the index of refraction down to 1, so that means no refraction, essentially. And if I turn the reflective weight to 0, then you just have a purely, should have just a purely transparent object. Yeah, so we're just seeing this object in the background, and there's nothing here. So let's turn that reflective weight back up a little bit. So now if we put a Fresnel layer on top, in this case I'll just use a diffuse reflection Fresnel. Oh, don't tell me it's doing it. It was working for me in my office, I swear to God. You guys should just come to my office. Everything works in there perfectly. <laughs> so we're getting that bad fall off again, but I'm not sure why we are. Let me, I'm just going to create a brand new one just to make sure it's not some weirdness. So instead of diffuse, I'm going to change this to transmissive. 
And then I'm just going to add a Fresnel. Let me try with an emission. So if we use emission and turn the intensity down to 1, even if we turn it down to 0, it might still work. Let me change it to a color we can see a little more obviously. Oh, we're going to turn that glossiness down again, or the roughness. There. So now we're getting the transparency in the middle with the emission layer on top blocking out part of it. So if we save that image. Let's turn down the index of refraction to 1. Ah, oh, look, that's maybe where the problem is. 1.1. Uh, it looks like if I turn it down too low then it starts giving us a bad fall off. I'm just going to see if I can turn the emission intensity to 0, see if it acts just like a, a diffuse layer. No. So intensity just turns it off. Yeah, see this is a bit buggy because it was working and then as soon as I changed some of the values we're getting this poor fall off again. Yeah. So I'm not sure why that's happening. Go back to 1.5. Yeah, see now it's better. It looks like you just have to change this back and forth. So it is, yeah, look at that. That's terrible. There is uh, some bugginess in here. So we can look at another way of doing this. But before we do, another one that you might want to look at that's actually could be quite useful is this one with, let's try transmissive clear. See what that does. If I change the index of refraction. Okay, so that's working. Now if I change this from emissive to a diffuse layer, let's see what that does. So that's working too. I can see it there. It's a little clearer on my screen, but because it's not emissive, it's dark down here where the light's not shining on it. So with the transmissive clear uh, base component it seems to work. This other one could be quite useful too. This is transmissive distance. And this was actually quite difficult to do before. You would use this for doing something like if you wanted to render a glass of milk, say, and you had you know, your glass, and then you could use this material on the milk if there was a spoon in it. So something like milk is somewhat transparent, but only from a certain distance away from the surface. After that, it gets, you'd see the spoon going into the milk a little bit, but then it becomes opaque quickly. So that's what transmissive distance can do for you. So you can change that distance at which it becomes, once it starts rendering out this color in an opaque way. So it's actually kind of useful for making a something but partly translucent or transmissive but feel like it has a volume, especially if there's something inside of it moving around. Um, so it looks like if you want to do this transmissive, now it should work with layers above, but you could see when I was trying it before, it wasn't. It? There's a bit of bugginess in here, but um, setting the base component to something transmissive and then adding a Fresnel on top should be able to give you the effect that you want. Now just to show you how we would have done this in the past, if I put uh, a different material like a, just a blend or something on here, um, I could use, oh that's not the right thing, I could do a Fresnel setup so We've got our blin. I'm going to map this out. 
Um, and in the transparency, we want it to be opaque on the edge, transparent in the middle. So for that, we could do something like create a ramp. So I'm going to hit tab, type in ramp. So that's just a gradient, so a ramp texture. So you can see what this is here, just from black to white. And then in Maya, there's this handy node called the sampler info node. Uh, there's a page about it on the wiki that I wrote a long time ago that describes all the things that it can do. But it's it's very useful for or sample, yeah, sampler info. And what this does is it's a node that gets uh, queried at um, at render time. So you tell use it to tell Maya to look for things in your scene and to act on what it finds. So in this case, we want to use it to tell Maya to look at the object to which it's applied and see which parts of its surface are facing the camera, which parts aren't. So this is stuff that's built into the Mila shader, but we used to have to build it by hand. There's also a ramp shader uh, that does something similar, but this gives you a little more flexibility. So you can see with this selected, it's got a whole bunch of weird stuff, pixel center, tangent camera, facing ratio, all this kind of stuff. It's facing ratio that we're interested in here. Facing ratio means the degree to which an object is facing the camera. So if we, if we connect these two things together, I'm just going to say other. So I middle mouse dragged. Okay, this is all different. Okay, so I would just want to connect the out. Uh, yeah, so the facing, yeah, sorry, the facing ratio into the UV cord. So this is just different the way that uh, into V cord. So now it's connected. So now if we just check this and render, nothing happens. I haven't connected to the blin. That's probably a good reason why it's not doing anything. So if I take this ramp and connect it to the transparency, and actually I'm going to cut that out. I'm just going to attach it to the color, just so it's easier to see. And I'll change the colors of the ramp. So now it'll look something like this. So it's using that sampler info to say the, the normals that are facing away from the camera will get this color, so that's why we see that here. And the normals facing the camera will get this color. So you could use this to also plug into the transparency uh, as well. So obviously the Mila thing is a little buggy uh, to get working, but and there are other ways to do it, but the Mila still offers a lot of uh, benefits. Um, there's also the Maya uh, ramp shader, which does this stuff, has some built-in things to achieve the same kind of look. So in the ramp shader, you've got color, for example, and then you can tell it to lay out that color over the surface based on certain things like the light angle. So if we change these to, again, red and bright blue. So depending on the way the light is pointing at it, it will render this out differently. I don't know if I apply this to my stuff yet. So you can see the lights coming from the upper left, so we're getting the red fading out into that light blue. There's no light down here to show off that blue. But you could also set this instead of light angle to facing angle, which is the same as facing ratio. And you can change the interpolation between these. So right now it's linear, so it just goes straight from blue to red. You can change it to smooth or spline. That will just soften the transition from one to the other.
see it's something like that. The limitation with the ramp shader is that you can see that you can set this to facing angle here, and that will control it for transparency, incandescence, and everything. You can't separate out one to be facing ratio, one to be light angle, so it's a little bit limited in that way, but for a standard fall-off sort of shader, you can use this pretty easily. Okay, so does that help? Can you go in the right direction? Okay. So let's just open up that last file to save. Okay, so I just wanted to render things out soon, so I'm just going to do, I'm just going to put a shader on here, and I'm just going to render from this frame where the object is behind. So that's 132, and then it, here where it goes in front. Oh, going the wrong way. So around one th 128, let's say to frame 151. So let me just put a new material on this thing. And this one, I'll just do something simple. Let's hit three to make sure this is all smooth. Now, one thing um, you'll see that my resolution gate is butting right up against the edge of my panel here, which is a bit of a pain. You can change it in the panel view. If you go to view camera settings. And down here, you've got resolution gate turned on. Instead of fill, you can try one of these ones. Usually overscan works. So overscan will just pull the resolution gate in from the edge of your panel so you can see. So let's say I want to render this out now. I'm going to do a few render layers and render passes. Okay, so let's just do a quick render and see what it looks like. Fantastic. Okay. So let's see if there's any reflections on in here. No, so it's not reflecting on the surface. I'm going to turn on shadows so we can render out a shadow pass. So I'll just create a simple light. Let's create a spotlight. Oops. They changed the button that you used to navigate with, so I always press the wrong one. So this thing I don't want casting shadows, this reflective sphere that I have. So I'm just going to open up the attribute editor and make sure shadow casting is turned off for that. Okay. So let's look through my shot cam. Go to my outliner. I'm just going to call that light, my key light. So usually your main light that you would label as your key light and any other lights would be named as back, fill, or any other light that's just filling in things a bit. Okay, so we're getting some weird uh, transparency here. I'm just going to get rid of that transparency for now. You can see it's coming through in the shadows too. So just select this. Okay. So that's good. Now you can see this thing is going into total darkness here. So we might want to put final gather on in here just to have some extra light bouncing around. It will raise our render times quite a bit, but we can just see what it's like. So in the render settings, under quality here, um, so the indirect diffuse global illumination mode is by default set to off 
we can turn it on to final gather and just see what sort of difference it makes without doing anything else. So final gather is going to sample the scene and look at objects that are close to each other and have light bounce around. So you can see now we've got sort of a nicer fill in here with the light that bounces off this surface from the key light and filling this in a little bit. So that didn't that added two seconds to our render time, so I can live with that. I'm just going to turn off one other thing here. I'm just going to get I'm just going to simplify this a little bit. Okay. So let's look at some simple things that we can do in this setup. So first of all, when you're breaking up a scene for rendering, you can look at what are foreground and what are background elements. And in this case, we don't really have a good separation between because our torus goes behind and in front. So if we want to render these things out separately, we're going to have to do that using a use background shader. So we could do a big beauty pass um, and just have things separated out for us by the Mila materials, but it's not going to give us the objects separate. We could do an ID pass for that by just giving uh, unique colors to each one that we can select them with, but I just want to look at using the Use Background Shader for this. So if we want to render this thing out on its own under Render Layers, we can select both of these things, and we need the light too, because the light has to be cast onto the object. And I'll call this Taurus render layer. And for this layer, I'm going to put a use background shader on this object. So when I'm in this layer, I can right click and assign a new material. And I'll just use Maya's Use Background Shader. So you'll remember from last time, we have to go in and I'm going to name this my uh, Alpha Cut, just so I remember, because you can use Background Shader for different things. And we just want to turn all of this off. And in this layer, we don't need shadows being cast, so I can open up the shape node for this, and on this layer, right-click and create layer override and turn off cast shadows. So what we'll see is something like this. You can see when it goes behind the object, the alpha channel is cut out. We're going to render, what did I say, from something like 127 to 151. So let's change those values. So use OpenEXR, name number extension, and I'll call this according to the scene name underscore render layer name. Going from 127 to 151. So what, what would be the approach if you had a scene where you were inside, for instance, like you have like an indoor scene or like an inside the body scene, and you don't really have a background anymore? Like, mm -hmm. Is there a use background shader for whatever is the background in the current situation? Well, if there's, no, not really. I mean, if you've got something in the background that never comes into the foreground, you can just render that out just on its own. Yeah and then just layer the other things in front of it. So, for example, um, if in these shots, let's say I had just a big plane, back here, or if whatever it was, if it was a model or something, and looking through the camera. This I would just, 
put on its own render layer with a light, render it out. If it's if the camera is moving, render it out for the whole sequence. If the camera is not moving, just render it out once. Uh, no, whatever it is. If itself is moving, they have to render it out multiple frames, obviously, and so on. One of the tricky things with this type of animation is figuring out what to do in the background, because you're often just in sort of non-defined space. Uh, and it kind of depends on the style of what you're doing, whether you have to fill it with models so when the camera moves it feels like there's something there, or if you can do it by painting plates to put in the background, just blurring out a little bit, that sort of stuff. Okay, so this is the Taurus render layer. And thanks, that's a good question. So now we're going to create the this thing in its own layer. We need the light, of course. And we'll create a new layer for that. Um, this is MVRL, MacOS render layer. And it should have the original material on it. Yep. So that's good. Now if we want to, we can separate out our shadow paths too. So in this layer, we don't want to have a shadow in this layer then. So in this layer, we'd want to select the light and turn off shadows. So just for this layer, so if we right click on use ray trace shadows, create a layer override, turn that off. Okay, so I'm just going to st stop here and just render out these two layers and start to assemble our scene in After Effects. So I'll just save things and make sure the settings are correct. Oh, see, wrong camera. I'm doing it HD 540, so that's half HD. Quality is low, but that's fine. Final gather is turned on. Okay, so save, and I will go to rendering and do a batch render. So in the meantime, while it's doing that, I'll open up after Effects. So I'm still using CS6 here. So it's rendering already, so I'll just grab one of those images. Hmm. Did I do something wrong? Quite possible. Oops. Forgot to check off the sequential. So you can see that the used background is cutting it off when it goes behind it, which is what we want. Although it's a little bit, I think I still have shadows turned on in this layer, which is dumb. You can see there it looks like shadows being cast onto it. So that's, this is one thing that does happen a lot. You, when you want to do a separate shadow pass or shadow layer, you have to make sure the shadows are turned off everywhere else. Otherwise you get doubling up of the shadows. So now it's doing the other one, so we can load in that layer.
Yeah, I didn't turn off shadows for that first layer, so it's falling into the shadow. So, let me just change my composition settings here. So you can see that it's still going behind, so you just have to make sure these are in the correct order. We want the torus to be on top. And so this allows us to have an object that can go in the background and then the foreground and still be kept as a separate layer. So it allows us to then go in and do things like change the color. So there are lots of different ways to change color. You can use hue and saturation and colorize it and change things like that. You can use things like tint. And you can map white to one color, map black to different color, get different effects like that. Change the color of this too. One thing I didn't do is separate out the final gather from the uh, the rest of it, so you can see some of that tint is coming across into this layer as well. So if I, I can change the color of this. Okay, so let's do a quick shadow pass here. So again, I'm just going to select all these objects, including my light. And I'm going to apply a new shader to this. Again, another use background shader. But this one I'm going to call my Uh, my shadow catcher. I'm going to turn everything down to zero except for the shadow mask and make sure the shadow is turned on in the light for this layer. So, let's just go to a spot where it looks like we should see a shadow. So we can see the shadow being cast by both these objects. Now in this layer, we don't want Final Gather turned on. So here we can go and turn Final Gather off. This layer. So unfortunately, there's no way to right click and do a layer override here. This is one of those weird ones where you have to go into the legacy options, go down to Final Gather here, right click, create layer override, and turn it off here. Now it should fix that. Yep. So now we just get the shadows being cast by those two objects. So we'll just do a batch render of that. Same settings. So I turned off the, the visibility for these layers, so it's only going to render at this one. You guys are off the quiet. So, and the last thing I might do here is um, I could do an ambient occlusion pass. It's not that important for this one, but where they get close together, we might want to have them self-shadowing. We've got shadow being cast, but sometimes the ambient occlusion creates a softer, nicer looking 
more realistic shadow. So if we were to, we can just duplicate this layer because it's got everything that we need. And here if we right click on it and go to the attributes of the layer itself, here where we, is where we can I just have to deselect everything. I'm going to do that. Attributes. Change this layer itself to an occlusion layer. And in the new shader that's created, in the out color, we can go to its connection, which is the ambient occlusion. We can turn up the quality of this and change the max distance that it will be evaluated. So let's change it to 5, something like that. And we can do a render just to see what it looks like. So you can barely see it here, but there's some ambient occlusion down here, the base of the thing. I can see it a little more on my screen. If I go to a point in the animation where they're a little bit closer together, you might see it a little more clearly. So you can see a little bit here, that's the self-shadowing of the inside of the torus. So in a case like this, you have to wonder whether it's worth doing, but uh, we can set it up for a quick render and take it out. I think the other batch render is finished. Yep. I should name this AO. Now if we go into After Effects, we can bring in Shadow Layer. And then it should It's a bit of a weird thing there. But it seems to be working otherwise. So we can just composite these in together. And then if you want to, you can turn down the opacity of that. If you want to soften it up, you can change the color of that. You can blur it slightly. So. So essentially, we're really just um, trying to make this as editable as possible in the future when we get into make, to making changes. Okay. Is there anything else you wanted to see in terms of compositing? Yeah. Can you show us how to when you do what? Oh, so you render a depth pass? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So the thing you have to remember about the, the two-dimensional depth that you're using, so you're faking uh, depth of field, is that it's, it's never going to be perfect, um, especially where you've got something very close against nothing or against something very far away, you've got a bright white against a black. You tend to get a halo around objects a little bit. Now you can, uh, so let me just select these two objects. So sometimes it's good if you actually put an object behind here uh, to, so it just doesn't go off forever. Um, so if we just create polygon plane, Move this back. Okay, so I'm just going to select these three things and create a new layer. So 
there are different ways of doing the depth, depth pass, but since we've already rendered out the other stuff, I'm just going to make a, a layer for the depth pass. So I'm going to put a new um, Mila material on all of these three things in this layer. And I'll just make it black. Yeah, so they're... They're, it's, they're, diff they're slightly different. I can show you both ways okay. of doing it. So when you do it this way with the, the Mila material, and I'll just call this uh, black Mila material. So now if I render this, there's no light in this layer or anything. It'll just be black. I don't need Final Gather turned on for this, so I'm just going to turn it off. I'll just turn it off everywhere for now. So we just have, I've got the big plane in the background, so there's no alpha channel to see. So in this layer, we can go to the, oops, already, to the scene, open passes, and turn on depth here. Now, let's see if this will work. We do a render. Let's see if it loads the pass for us. Nope. So we'll just do a batch render of this layer and hope that it does it. So we're doing the same as we can. Okay, so that's going to start rendering. Let's just go back into here and grab our ambient occlusion layer. So you can see there's some self-shadowing here. So if we just turn this layer to multiply, it will get rid of all the white and just leave the black. So it's not going to make a huge difference. Let me just deselect that layer. So if, but you can see over here a little bit some of the self-shadowing that it's casting on and around the base here. So in this, this is not a great example of when to use ambient occlusion because it's so subtle, but when you have more objects close together, uh, it's very useful to have. So now it's rendering at the depth. So let's just see what it's doing for us here. Okay, so finished. So let's we'll drag this over. And we've got to extract the depth using the extractor. Uh, 3D channel extractor. Now hopefully it shows up. Depth Z, depth Z, depth Z. And then we can tweak our black and white point. There. Okay, so that's pretty good. So I'm just trying to get a good fall off between black and white, with some gray in between. So, right, it looks very banded on this screen because it's low resolution. But this is just a pass to say that things that are white are closer to the camera, things that are darker are farther away from the camera. So we can use this to apply an effect in different ways. So we want to apply this effect, a blur effect, to everything, everything else. So we've got to pre-compose all the stuff below it. So pre-composing just means to gather them into a new comp, right? So Command-Shift-C is the short form. You want to make sure this is turned on. Move all attributes to the new composition. And I usually call this one pre-blur. So now you can see it's been put into a single comp. And now you can apply different effects to this using this depth map as a guide. So if I right-click on pre-blur, the comp, and go to blur, there's the camera lens blur here. Okay, so we're applying it to the 
layer to be blurred, and then we have to tell it which layer to use as a blur map. So the, SAMP, the SMAPLE comp depth. Then we have to turn off the SMAPLE comp depth. And then we have to, I don't use this one much anymore, but we change the blur focal point. So you can see it going blurry there, right? So let's turn up the roundness. Oh uh, no, what's, how do you do blur? Oh, blur radius, yeah. So let's really turn it up, exaggerate it, so we can see what's going on. And if we move the blur focal distance, we can try and bring part of it into focus and leave part of it out of focus. Now we don't really have any background elements here, so it's not going to make uh, a big difference, or it's not going to be very easy to see. But we're not getting a halo against this one, so it is going out of focus, but it's not... Uh, Let's move it. So we can see if we can get this this to blur out the shadow on the surface here. So there's not a lot of difference between this color white and this color here, right? So it's gonna hard, it'd be hard to get this working that well. So one thing um, you can do with the iris properties here, when something is really blurred, you want it to assume the shape of the aperture of the camera, and this by default is set to hexagon. Uh, and so this will give more camera-like blur. Um, the other way to do something like this is to not use the camera blur, but instead use an adjustment layer. So if we create an adjustment layer in between the blur layer and the pre blur comp, we can put a blur on the adjustment layer, which will be applied to everything below it. So if I just do a fast blur, and then use that depth map as a track mat, then it's going to apply it differently over the surface. So kind of hard to see, but this is in focus. It's going out of focus down here. And in this case, we can adjust the depth map using things like levels, and those effects will be felt in the way the, the blur is applied. So you can see the blur shifting over the back there. So I'm pulling in. So if I turn on the visibility, you can see that I'm just moving the black and white points around. So I can pull in the black and the white to make a sharper fall off. And then this will be in focus and this will go out of focus. And then you start to get this halo around here. So this is one of the big limitations of the 2D uh, camera blur. Um, it's because there's such a sharp fall off between the white of this and the black of this. It's blurring everything inside of this, but it's not blurring the edge of the object. If we don't have this installed here, but um, I use something called um, Frischluft for this. So uh, Frischluft, there's a depth of field plugin. And so if we use Frischluft and turn on the depth layer that we want to use, turn up the radius. Radius here means amount of blur. And then you can use this marker to select the depth, the thing you want to be in focus. So you can move this around and it will change the focus. Again, this isn't a great one for depth because we've got so, we've got such a shallow depth. I guess if we move this to the foreground, we can try it with this. So our depth map now looks like this. 
just going to get rid of these levels so it looks like this. And if we go to our our radius, select depth. Not doing much. Um, oh, no, I did select the layer. Well, anyway, <laughs> that's how you uh, you can set it up. Now, again, it's only going to work in a layer where there's good separation of depth um, for this to work on. And if you are using the camera lens blur for this in the way uh, that I was using it earlier, um, turn this off. The camera lens blur will not pay attention to any levels changes you put on the depth map. So what you want to do, you can put levels changes on it, but you have to pre-compose it with itself. Um, and then it will read those levels changes. So in that case, if you just select just that layer, pre-compose it, move all attributes to that layer, and then it will start paying attention to those effects that you put on in terms of the levels. So you can shift the focal distance here. You can see the vignetting that you get here when you're trying to blur things out in the extreme foreground. So there are, are real limits to what you can do. Um, you can, uh, oops, you can, uh, for the future, you could purchase that uh, plugin. As a professional, I would always use something like that. After Effects, I don't know why they don't just buy that company, because everybody uses that. Uh, that thing. And you can actually render out depth of field from Maya, but then it's baked into every render. So uh, if you wanted to make changes into you have to go right back into Maya and re-render it out again. Do you want to see anything else? Let me show you. This first shot, I've seen you guys rendering stuff already, but this is where I just wanted you to experiment trying to implement these things. Uh, I've shown you just a, a few things that you can do uh, with, you know, ambient occlusion, shadow, separating things out into their own layers. But each shot's going to demand something different. In some shots, you don't have to do any of this type of separation. It's just not necessary. Um, but you'll see by doing the first shot, where you can do things more efficiently, less efficiently, uh, where it's useful to spend the time setting it up that way in Maya, where it's not worth your effort. Okay? Okay, so it's 2.45 now, so we've got an hour and a bit left over, so I can just come around and see how people are doing with their shots.